the work of, of uh, another woman, Jane Wheeler, who was part of Can I Get a Witness? Jane Wheeler has an organization called RHYME, Rethinking Identity Medicine Ethics. Mm -hmm. She would be a good guest. Um, Jane, we had this long conversation about, you know, it's all the internet's fault, some people have said. And I go, no, 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 I read a book, you know, and that's the thing that fed into my mind. Am I going to ban books because I had access to somebody's autobiography? You know, an right. older man who had this thing. It opened my mind to something. And yes, I couldn't stop obsessing about it. But the obsessing comes for different reasons. So Jane and I had a conversation about why these groups that, you know, uh, Lisa Littman was finding, you know, with kids that were getting on the internet and they'd find these friend circles and then right. all these girls. Rapid onset this, gender this rapid, yeah. And then this phrase comes along. Okay, now we got a name for it. You know, here's this thing. And one of the things about that is that we were, she and I were talking, we're around the same age, how that there's no sense anymore that children are growing up with privacy. Mm, interesting. We need to understand the difference between, remember when, I don't know if you did it, we used to write diaries. We would write at the end of the day sometimes, you know, so-and-so kicked me in the leg today. I'm going to get him back tomorrow and I'm in love with so-and-so and I'm going to marry her. And someday. then hide it. Hide it. Hide Locked it. it. <laughs> he, under the mattress, somewhere. No one was going to find this, right? That kind of stuff of having private worlds or even more feminine girls. And I know, cause I walked in on friends of mine. I hated dolls. I would just like, wait till they were done playing with their dolls, but they'd get the dolls and they'd interact with the dolls and, and they were working out their stuff. They were talking about how they felt their feelings of how they were feeling rejected or how they were in love with somebody or what they were going to do, how they were going to problem solve. And women do things like that. And boys don't get encouraged to do that. They get encouraged to get the the little toy gun and let's go solve this, you know, and get this person down and all that. So girls are working that stuff out really early and privacy, the idea of, I kept a diary for a, for a long while. And then I burned a bunch of them when I was in high school, I decided I don't need to see that. Cause a lot of them had a lot of sadness in there. Burn, burn, burn. Right. But we wrote, 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 there's no writing anymore. There's picking up the cell phone. There's looking like this at a computer. Yeah. I'm going to have a YouTube channel now. Yeah. And, and just yeah. vomiting yeah. one thing after the next yeah. and going, why are you telling the world where you live? Why are you bending over so low so we can see your chest? Young men getting on and doing all kinds of stupid stuff and adjusting their pants and hearts fall out. And this has become the diary. What that's done is what we talked about earlier, Aaron, is when you don't have privacy and you don't understand privacy, how are you going to learn boundaries? And that's where I really feel concerned is, and that's, you know, sort of relating it back to my childhood is that I didn't learn about boundaries and it causes, it causes issues in all facets of life when you don't have the ability to set those boundaries. And it seems like this movement now is actively undermining children's boundaries and, and, and it's just become this insidious thing where, you know, first you hear, you know, sixth graders are being encouraged to have sex and encouraged and they're taught about, you know, masturbation. And then you hear, you know, third graders. And now we're hearing about kindergartners being told that they get to choose what sex they are. And this is happening in, in our public schools. And it's, it's, you know, I'm guessing it's one of the things that motivated you to put on the Can I Have a Witness conference and organize people because like me, you're, you're looking at our children and just incredibly concerned about what's happening. Yeah, because I well know this thing about so talking about my friend Jane Wheeler, she's looking at those areas of why are kids even thinking this way and that there has been such a an erasure of boundaries with us, again, that just blabbing things out, you know, that could be super personal, that could be used against the person or whatever. But the thing is that people aren't working things out in the ways that we used to, that used to cause us to pause, take time, make eye contact usually, um, have these conversations and things like that. That the idea of technology moving ahead doesn't mean that we have not only not necessarily moved ahead, we have in many ways. I love the internet. I love that we have these tools. But again, like anything else, what are we doing with them? What are the boundaries around how we're using this stuff? Can I Get a Witness came about, it's going to sound 
funny, but you know, I got kicked off Twitter and a lot of people that have either lost jobs, they've been doxxed or things have happened or they got, you know, whatever. I mean, with MK Fain, um, you know, she got dumped from her job for making some comment about whatever. You and know, the, the, the unbelievable, Megan Murphy, the threat Megan against Murphy gets Raleigh. kicked off Twitter. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I read the, the, I mean, it's just horrifying to me that, that it's okay now for men to threaten to rape women who they disagree with. This is now acceptable. And, and one of the things that really cemented this mentality, you know, how scary this has gotten is I went to testify in Alabama um, about legislation to try and ban these interventions for children. Mm -hmm. And as I was walking down the hallway, you know, as I said, I'm shorter than you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm, a yeah. little, I'm a tiny person. And the walls were lined with men in dresses and they were saying cunt and whore. And they were just being, you know, in any other situation, somebody would have stood up and said, what's going on here? We don't, we don't do this. Men don't harass women this way. Yeah. But in this case, these men were being celebrated because they claimed to be women. And I guess if you're a woman, it's okay to harass other women. I mean, it's, it's a very bizarre kind of time in, in, in our culture where all of a sudden men's feelings have been elevated above women's rights and protections. But you do realize this is all based on money. Oh, yeah. It started with money, with a decades-long plan. And going back to my community that got decimated, and I brought up about the film festival, the content of the films began to change radically so that every year we were seeing everything start going to this idea of the T, which for a few of us, when the T got introduced, it was like, oh, that's about transsexual, but that has nothing right. to do with sexual orientation. Right. No. So now are they saying that our movement, our thing is now instead of the celebration of something, we're now going to be incorporating something that they're trying to say they're being oppressed, huh? Is this yeah, and it's so interesting. It you think about my first sort of experience with transsexualism, it's Rocky Horror Picture Show. You know, and of course, you know, everybody would go and they would dress up and it was, you know, I'm a transsexual from Transylvania and it was, you know, this cool. Right. Um, and that's kind of my schema for transsexual, um, which has nothing to do with sexual orientation and the LGB. Right. So how did it get yeah. kind of in there? How did it become one of the letters that that comedian was predicting? But, well, there we go. And again, according to research an article after article that Jennifer Bilek has done. There are literally like six to 10 people. Most of these are white billionaire males that have money and, and some are former military. This is another very interesting thing. When you study autogynophilia, particularly there's a military background a lot with a lot of these guys, but the thing is they're billionaires and where are most, where most of their money coming from are a few different fields. It's mostly it's big pharma, number one, robotics, synthetics, you know, biochemistry, all of this stuff. And if you look at the work of, uh, of this, uh, look at the investments and everything and the work and he, it's, it, they're not, they're hiding in plain sight. Martine Rothblatt, is a major player with this. So we look at the back of why is it that I could walk in or you could go into Planned Parenthood tomorrow and say that we're trans and I want to get testosterone. I could literally leave the clinic now with that when 30 years ago, I would have had to wait for at least two years to try to prove myself. And at back again, as that woman that I was talking about, you know, her big thing now is that she says they, 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 saw that after a while she was going to the, you know, the psych, the psychologist or whatever. And they said, yeah, she's really a guy. And she validates herself that way and say, she's really a guy. She just played it up. And I knew that that's what you would have to do. If I had done this with my therapist, she probably would have ended up referring me maybe to somebody else or trying to really keep me in there because she saw, and, it, and I'm telling you, I went in there tough. I wasn't like, well, I think I might be, I'm like, no, I, I know I'm a guy. And she went, no, let's look at this. And then by the time you start exploring on a weekly basis, right, there's that slowing down time. There's the pause to even look at that. And here it is, I'm almost 30 years old. That's why it's ridiculous to say anybody that's 40 or 50. I know women that are grandmothers, older lesbians in their 70s, 
who have grandchildren that are non-binary and this and that, and their daughters, some of their daughters have transitioned and stuff. And some of these older lesbians, what is one of the worst things that could, that anybody can ever be is an old woman in our culture. It's fine. So with, can I get a witness? The thing is, is that yes, a lot like you, I felt like if I were a little tomboy today and living in California, which is one of the most dangerous states aside from New York that I think we can live in currently in the United States, if I was that little eight-year-old tomboy that I was, and I was pretty smart, and if I knew that I could tell my teachers, I want my name to be Mike, and they'd go, okay, and at school I'm getting treated like a boy, my parents don't know anything about it. I just know that I feel great when I'm at school and there's maybe some scuffles with some of the kids, but I'm going into the boys' bathroom maybe if I even wanted to. The girls are starting to sort of shun me out of their, out of their space or maybe not <laughs> because women's spaces, uh, girls' spaces are being invaded. Um, I know that if I came home and I said to my parents, so I want to be a boy and they're like, no, and yeah, I want to take, I want to get puberty blockers. And now I'm nine years old. And I basically tell them, well, for a year, the whole school's been treating me like a boy. What's your problem? And now, of course, I'm probably posturing more. I'm kind of acting more like whatever and thinking. And my parents are like, no, 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 really? And maybe I even get spanked. I got spanked as a kid, part of the generation, but Maybe I do, maybe I don't. But my parents, if they today said, well, that's not going to happen. Now I go back to the school and I said, my parents are against it. And now the school supports me. And now I know they either have the school psychologist or whatever contact my parents and say, your daughter's really trans. And now my parents are caught up as I know these parents are and they're going, what? And now I want to be a boy and my parents aren't letting me. And I'm nine years old, damn it. And for a year, I haven't felt so great because I'm being recognized and this is cool. And I haven't really been taking any puberty blockers or anything yet, but I know that that's what I want because I know. And I probably saw it online or something somewhere I heard. And now I know my parents aren't going to let me. I know that I could take them to court and make them. And damn it, I would. And if I could get away from my house and be raised by other people. Who are going to affirm you. Who are going to affirm me and they know that I'm going to be God damn it, I'm going to be the man that I want to be. Because that's all I have in my head is I don't want to grow up to be an old woman. That is one of the most <gasps> horrifying things, right? That's why actresses don't make it much past 40 in our culture. <laughs> Again, lesbians are saying no to men. Old women are not in the, our popular culture. They're not sexy. They're not marriage material they're not bed material so you get that combination of an older lesbian which is what i was talking about at some point i know a 76 year old lesbian grandmother who started taking testosterone and she says oh. she's decided she's trans oh no the kids think she's so cool right she has got an ill she has another illness going on we don't know how long she has to live. My friend's saying to me, why would she do that? I said, she's probably feeling her mortality. She's been a butch lesbian her whole life. It's a hard life to be rejected so much by a look, by a, a word, by people stop whispering and then they look at you wondering, did you hear what they were saying? How ugly is this person? How she looks like a man? Why does she not just do that? The encouragement to go that route is so there. So yeah, there's a 76 year old lesbian grandmother that had started taking some testosterone to which her lover was joking around and she said, you're already getting hair, honey. You know, it's sad because I think about even now, you know, and I've lived a life, I'm, you know, at a point where I'm settled. Even now I think, gosh, it would be nice to be able to walk down the street and not be a woman, to not be a woman who is sexualized, to not be a woman who is, you know, judged whether or not I'm attractive. You know, as you mentioned, as we get older, there's, you know, this sense that you just get old and ugly. And, 
And, and I can't imagine if I were younger now with all that pressure, because I grew up at a time where at least there was an attempt to pretend like that wasn't what was so important and that women could be firefighters and women could be architects and that, and that your, 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 you know, how you looked wasn't what defined you. At least there was sort of, we paid, paid lip service to it. But now these girls right. are just being indoctrinated with this, you know, idea that if you don't look a certain way, if you're not pretty enough, you're not attractive enough, if you're fat, if you're, you know, maybe if you, if you have some, you know, hair on your chin and you're a woman that you're just, you're ugly. And, and, yeah. and, and despite the fact that we've tried to move away from these regressive stereotypes and this objectification and sexualization of women, it seems like we're doing it more now than ever. Yeah. You know what? I was just thinking that I might've screwed up my years. Maybe it's because of my age, but I kept talking about this stuff in 1985. I'm thinking, wait a minute, I'm talking about 95. Isn't that 25 years ago? 25, 26 years ago is 1995. Uh-huh. That's everything that I said earlier about the years, except that it was true about the pills and all that stuff. And what just clicked off in my head was something that you said, because in 1995, when in San Francisco, there was a big, all of a sudden, it was about the money and the trailing of the money. And when did the T come in and all of that? And in 1995 is when the T LGBT came in. That's so interesting because I wonder if it is related to, I mean, that's the big pharma thing. That's the money. That's what I'm saying. Like everybody was so worried about AIDS. And then by the nineties, we had come up with a lot of treatments. And so there was sort of this energy to try and, so what I will, what I can do is I can go back in the video and just change, you know, when I'll say, you know, put something like 80, 90, but it is 95. It was 90, it was 95 again, because I went back and I went, oh yeah, it had to do with that. I'm, I'm being approached about, I'm being approached about this, you know, in the early nineties, the comedian in 1990 did say, we're going to go to just letters, which happened in 1995. Right. Woman, that's when she did what she did. And that's when we started to see this influx all of a sudden and testosterone. So these pills became more available on a mass, in a mass way that this woman had been starting to go through, you know, her psychological process and whatever like that. And that I had also been already through that. I was doing that in the late eighties. I was doing that. And now reading Jennifer's work, Billick's work, the LGBT center, you know, that happened in San Francisco, in Los Angeles, in these cities, in these major cities with large populations of of lesbians and gay men. And yes, just on the end of sort of post AIDS, the the massive crisis, which was still going on, and it was still going on in 1990, um, that didn't stop. But um, the influx, the introduction to the T, it got shown in our media. It started happening in what was available on cable television. This, I don't know the year that Logo TV came out, but that Logo was a channel that was for gays and lesbians, supposed to be celebrating our lives and whatnot. But the whole, all the money that Jennifer has traced and everything and the timing of when this happened. So here's this young woman who completely changes her body, goes into porn, influences these other women who are feeling already you know who what am i who am i testosterone becomes more available the t gets very big and i mean every magazine everything around the whole west coast and i think it moved from here and it certainly went to la and it moved up to portland and it hit seattle and then all of a sudden vancouver and we are seeing a rash of these women who say that they are now FTMs and some of them say they're not really using trans men. That was later. That was into the 2000s when that started to happen. But this demise happened. When you said earlier, I feel like I can't, you know, support the community anymore. Erin, there's no community. There hasn't been one. So it's a concept of this LGBT was a community. Well, and one of the things that, um, that, that came up a couple of times in the, um, can I have a witness 
conference is the idea of the language and yes. how the language has, and it's even, it's even hard for me to talk about it. I mean, when, when you're talking about this particular person in my mind, I, I have to consciously call her she, because in my mind, I've sort of accepted, oh, she he. says he's a he, therefore yeah. I will call she a he. And, and the same with, you know, I think there are a lot of people with Blair White who would be, of course, you're going to call Blair White he, she. Um, would you expect Blair White to go into the, the, the men's bathroom, really? Would you really want to put Blair at risk of that? That would be so dangerous for Blair um, without any concern about sort of what, what, males coming into women's restrooms, the, the effect of that. But there's, you know, it's even someone who is as aware as I am, I struggle. And I usually say, you know, men who claim to believe they feel like women, but that's a mouthful. And if you say that say men who pretend time, pretend to be women, men who pretend to be women. Yeah. One of the things about, you brought up about, can I get a witness again, that struck me the most profoundly. And it wasn't the first time that I've been struck by this woman's words, Julia Long, Dr. Mm -hmm. Julia Long, and this idea, and going back to Magdalene Burns, mm -hmm. um, I don't want to curse, but her, her I mean, it's a, it's a famous quote from her, I'd rather be rude than a fucking liar. Mm -hmm. There is something so deep about that. And I feel like Julia Long continues that when she says, don't use their words. Don't use their language we need, and I'm saying it, we need to reclaim. Right. See, I don't have a problem the way that, that you're doing. I don't have a problem. When I see any of these people that other people say, he, she, oh, gee, I get so confused because what they're doing is they've already, because I've looked the extreme of male. I have gone into places. I have had, without even thinking really that I'm passing, people that are very ignorant, that have not been around women that are more on that spectrum, which we all have the potential to demonstrate a very large spectrum, right? I don't have any problem. I, I see, when I see these women who claim to be trans and I just go, that poor woman, she's a lesbian and she's never dealt with her body and being in her body and loving her sexuality and learning how to be in that comfortable, in that body, looking any way that she wants to, the same thing, you know, for a male. And Julia talks about making sure, taking back language. And yeah. it's, just, it's like everything else. It's relearning because we have a tendency because we've been enculturated. And again, I take this back to misogyny. It might be because, you know, uh, that people say, oh, because women bear children, you know, that we're more sensitive. There's a thing about wanting to be kind and just having a decency, you know, in speaking with somebody like Blair White. If I ever met him, Today, I would definitely say him and I would refer to him as him and he'd be pissed off. And I'd say he's a man and I've seen him. I've seen him in interviews do that. But years ago, because Blair is a gay man in my eyes and I heard him at one point say something about being gay. I don't, it was a long time ago. I know that he, you know, used to identify himself as a gay man before he started, you know, injecting all this stuff into his body. I would have said, I would have said she, in the privacy of our culture of being gay and lesbian, right. again, like with the drag queens, but that was just me. Not all lesbians would do that, but I would do that. I felt if they went to that effort and they're doing this thing to pull off a facade, just like they'd say to me, hey boy, come over here. We joke around. Well, and it, part other. of it is that as, as I think we, we try to be kind to people and yeah. we try to, you yeah. know, I mean, there is this sense that, that we want to be nice, especially since this is a marginalized community. And yes. I think that that's something that, um, that I kind of want to address that um, I have this feeling and I sense it from you and a lot of us that we have um, a sense of compassion for mm -hmm. women who, who are identifying as male and going down that route. Um, whereas um, at least I tend to feel a lot of ambivalence towards males who are claiming to be females. And I think it's because in my mind, there's a very different motivation going on. I agree. Um, and, and in my mind, when I see a woman who is insisting that she is a man, I see self-hatred, I see um, you know, an, an attempt to try and sort of springboard out of the confines of womanhood that have mm -hmm. been put on her. 
-hmm. Whereas when I see a man who claims to believe he's a woman, I see a man who has no idea what it's like to be a woman and is trying to pretend to be a woman in a very offensive way. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure what, what is your take on that? Misogyny. So when I go back, it's something that you said earlier is that it is a misogynistic society that we live in that says that a woman who's over 40, and again, when I look in terms of Hollywood, I'm a cinephile and I study a lot about actors and actresses and, and it's only extremely new in terms of our culture that an actress over 40 actually gets roles and there are actually movies about older women that aren't that aren't devils and they're not you know the creepy daughtering old ladies some horrible yes yeah, some horrible thing i mean in my whole lifetime we grew up with women they'd sort of kind of disappear after they turned 40 years old the, the different motivations you were talking about yeah i think that misogyny creates this idea that women are disposable after a certain age because if we're not going to bear children or be objects of a sexual desire other than mothering or being maternal what good are women that is what all men and women are are fed that there are very rare men that i've found that have been raised with fantastic mothers that they were swarmed by sisters and they got to see the journeys that their sisters went through and then hopefully they became really strong good brothers and and they work together to protect each other you know and work well, with and it makes family. me so sad it makes me so sad that um women who potentially could be leaders as women who could start redefining what it means to be a woman mm -hmm. are are instead sort of rejecting women womanhood and saying that they're men um, it, and I get it. I mean, I, I, I have no doubt that if I were younger, I, I would have gone down that route. I have no doubt whatsoever. Um, and, I, and I'm just wondering, how do we pull them back in? And, and how do we start redefining womanhood so that, that our goal as women isn't to be, to judge ourselves based on a male definition of success, but that we get to start saying, you know, and, 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 and empowering each other, which is something I don't see women doing. And you're doing it with this channel in a way. That's one of the things I wanted to say again. Thank you. Because I think that the, I call it just everyday activism, whether you've got a YouTube channel, the fact is that I spent a year and a half developing this idea about doing a conference. Yes, it was to look at when I saw all these different women uh, being, being released of their jobs or, you know, kicked off of social media for saying or doing the most in, 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 inane things. When Vaishnavi Sundar, the Indian mm -hmm. filmmaker, makes a movie that's all about women. It had nothing to do with anything about, you know, men who are pretending to be women. Uh, she made a movie called, what, But What Was She Wearing? It's the only film out of India made by an Indian woman about Indian women being sexually harassed and how that in, is also with rape culture. A very important film that gets completely stuck off to the side. So I wanted to do a conference, as I was saying earlier, in person. And once for months that was in process. I had my main speakers and everything, like anybody that's been to a conference, a typical thing, a long day, competing workshops, different topics, the main speakers, a media room, a media room where I would have had Magdalene Burns videos playing all day and you could put headphones on and catch any one of her like 60 videos or whatever. And when COVID hit, I had already invested money. I'd already gotten my people planned and I had three options to either just dump the whole idea or postpone it and try to go for some other date. I mean, I was already looking at August of 2020, and this is back in September that pretty much I'm looking at that date, or to try to go online with this new thing that, oh my God, how am I going to do it? I've heard about this thing called Zoom. I knew I had to hire somebody if I was going to do that. I gave myself basically 12 hours and I went, that's it going to go online. I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to do it. And because I'm not a person that's like glass half empty, I went, cool, this could be international now. You're right. And so Vaishnavi was actually one of the first people that I thought of in terms of 
this international guest. And then I started thinking of all these other people and five solid months of literally 10 to 15 hours a day hiring a tech person who we just happened to get on really well and and creatively you know the thing is that i'm producing this thing so i'm putting all the money out if people don't know what producing is i mean that's it you're you're putting money out but i also was like the director i had my vision i when i got kicked off twitter i got on a big piece of paper i always keep really huge paper around and i started drawing out what i thought the physical thing was going to be and then it was taking COVID hits and it's like how do i transfer that physical idea oh damn i'm gonna lose workshops i'm gonna lose work i'm gonna lose that as i was saying earlier my tech gal in about i don't know a month after we've been working together she said i got this idea she's much younger than i am i'd never heard of slack oh. <laughs> She says, Joey, you know, I know that it's really bothered you about losing this, this thing, but I also had made the decision that I was going to cut out the chat feature on Zoom. And at that point, I mean, a month in, I've already seen a bunch of Zooms. I'm getting the culture. I'm kind of looking at what's going on. And what I wanted was for people to really concentrate on the speaker. I knew that I was taking a risk by eliminating that chat, but I thought, you know, I want people to really spend time and look at the speaker. And did you have an overarching theme when you initially went into it? I mean, I like that the yes. title is, Can I Get a Witness, which I think is provocative. Well, Can I Get a Witness is, a, I had to create a company. There's the thing is, there's worth thousands of dollars I spent. And I, like I said, I was never going to be outed as the producer. I had, a, I have a fake name and everything about this, but I got a, I got an LLC and I got a, the name of the company is Can I Get a Witness that's operating out of an LLC. And I did a lot of work, a lot of homework to try to stay anonymous and not come out as the producer. But anyway, that, that, so that's another story because I was outed the very first weekend that this got launched. Um, can I get a witness? The original title I had was Gender Ideology and Fighting Back. It was like that. You know, take, taking, uh, yeah, taking on gender ideology or something. It had a lot more of a kind of combative thing. Mm -hmm. And in a conversation with my friend Jane Wheeler, who I had invited to be one of the guests, we sort of battled it out on the phone. I was talking about it. She said, no, I don't know about that. She convinced me and came up with, you know, it wasn't just, can I get a witness? Voices from the trenches became, instead of fighting back, gender ideology fight. It was like voices from the trenches because I already had in my mind that this was going to be the debut of, can I get a witness? And that what I saw happening was probably going to be a series in the next year or so of different conversations that were not only possibly around gender ideology, although that's my focus is the damage that it's doing and what are people doing? What are the proactive things that people are doing around the world mm -hmm. and having successes with? That was a big thing that I wanted to have happen. But like with you, the idea of watching on a daily basis, it seems like kids getting mutilated and look, we're looking at the, the world's largest, I think most historic, eugenics experiment on young bodies that we've the world has ever known and the condoning of it by another part of my former tribe now liberal yeah. liberal, liberal people yeah and, 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 and i don't know how you've like made sense of it but as someone who identified as a liberal leftist you know democrat my whole life i am I am feeling completely homeless. I, I feel completely homeless. like I am, I am out to sea without, without a boat because um, I don't know where I belong anymore. I don't know okay. because the, 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 or the group, the, the affiliation that I always felt uh, most aligned with because it fought for children's rights, because right. it fought for women's rights, because it fought for the rights of those who are being oppressed, has now become the oppressor. They're yeah. the ones who are now conducting this experiment on our children. They're yeah. the ones who are calling us Nazis and saying that we deserve to be put up against the wall and killed. And this is not, I, I don't recognize it. I don't know what yeah. happened. And I don't know if I just never really understood or if it has changed in such a fundamental way but i money. 
yeah, I mean, it's just money. It's astonishing to me. They want to act like, you know, they're not taking money and it's definitely there. But can I get a witness was, you know, I, I, somebody had asked me recently about what was the purpose of it and stuff. And the thing was that not only did I take it to a level where, okay, I'm going to have international people talk about how it's affected them and what they're doing. Sorry, I have some cat hair or something in my face. <laughs> um, but uh, again, the proactive things that people are doing. But I wanted to make sure if I was going to have this thing go on, it went from four hours to six. All of a sudden, I'm at eight and 10, and it became 13 and a half hours, 30 presentations. I needed to make sure that all 30 of those presentations, while there would be sort, some sort of overlap, like with Julia Long bringing up language, that was a very specific thing, but it came up in different ways, a few, a few things that people said. While there were touching points, I wanted very personal approaches, some that were like Sasha Ayad with a very, you know, she's a clinician. There's a way that she's doing the work a that she- A clinician who is now recommending people don't take their kids to therapists. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> so there was, there was, I wanted to have a really wide range and I, even, I took a risk. I lost some friendships when I would tell people about where they'd say, oh, where's your, where's your conference at now? And I'd tell them, oh, I just got so-and-so. And they'd go, why did you, why did you ask so-and-so to be involved? You've ruined the whole thing. And I said, you know what? You don't know what's in my head. I have a goal with this. And I purposefully did this so that that woman, Moira Deeming, not her specifically, but here's this woman in Australia yeah. who says she's a conservative woman. She was so affected by this thing that it caused her to write an article for the spectator. And she focused not on the conference itself, but what's going on in Australia. And I have received, I mean, it, Aaron, it created something that was much bigger than the vision that I originally had. I mean, I, I wanted it to expose what's going on with children. And so I put all that stuff up at the front because a lot of people will go to conferences and they ditch out after three hours. Mm -hmm. I figured if they were going to ditch out, they had to have this stuff in their face. I wanted the money from Jennifer to be there. I wanted Jane Wheeler to talk about her organization. I wanted Sasha to hit. I wanted Abigail to start it out with a wonderful clip that she had sent. This was all about the kids. And when I invited Quentin Van Meter, Dr. Quentin Van Meter later as the endocrinologist, you know, I got some hell for that. Because why? He's a Catholic. He's a religious man. I'm an but he's atheist. also incredibly dedicated to this. I mean, and you know, that's what I think you have to, and that's where the Compassion Coalition, which, you know, I've tried mm -hmm. to put together is, is this sense that we need to work together on this because this is so yeah. important that we can't let these, um, you know, these differences yeah. in ideology affect us. If we're going to save the kids, we have to work together. And, but there's the thing, it, it all comes down and what people in other countries, like in the UK a lot, they might think that they understand American politics and money. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't care about criticism anymore from anybody about, oh, you're working with the right. And I say, really, who's the right anymore? I mean, That's of course I still have in my mind, but the thing is that I'm working with the right in ways. If I'm talking to a, a Republican representative from some state like Idaho or Utah or whatever, and they want to keep men out of women's sports, I will work with them because that's another very strong, I mean, there's just so many areas, but with, can I get a witness? What I wanted, Erin, was for people to have the kid issue right in their faces up front. Then I wanted to have representation from a wide variety of people, people with websites, people with just experience in a particular area. I had my, a concerned citizen, you know, a man who lives in Sweden, who is also formerly, you know, from the UK, who's also black. And he was able to bring in this idea. Don Smith, he talked about the colonization of women's bodies, just like his people. He's got Afro-Caribbean roots and doing a history with that. And you're seeing all these people and lesbians. I wanted ultimately for lesbians to feel like you're not alone. I know that you, like me, even though right in my own community, they've tried to fire me from my job for being hateful, which they've never been able to actually have never done anything hateful towards somebody like that. Um, this, the way that they've stolen our language, the way that they've stolen the narrative, the way that they've turned everything into, even with the language, 
all of a sudden, I've never heard the word literal being used so much. I almost hardly, hardly ever use it anymore. <laughs> literal, what's violence, you know, all of this well, stuff. Well, the fact that now um, you and I can be accused of violence by misgendering somebody, and yet those men who are calling me cunt and whore and bitch as I'm walking down the hallway, that wasn't considered violence. And that's what's disturbing is that the whole definition of oppression and violence and um, discrimination is being turned on its head. And, and it makes it really dangerous for those of us who are trying to stand up and say, wait a minute, the emperor has no clothes. What's going on here? Um, and I can't imagine for you as someone who's been in, in the movement as long as you have, how frustrating that must be for you as a lesbian to now be told that you're you know, transphobic because you don't want penises in the bathrooms with you and you don't want to have to sleep with a penis because you're a lesbian. <laughs> you know, it just, I can't imagine how and frustrating I'm that must very be. very lucky, I'm very lucky that I'm not a 16 year old girl who's most of the social contact, especially during COVID, has been online mm -hmm. trying to find friends in a community and mention a few things, or maybe they see a picture of my 16-year-old face and I look like a, you know, a little tomboy. And they go, oh, you're trans. Right away, there's the word, there's the word, there's that constant thing. So yeah, those people that are calling me transphobe, at my job, trying to get me fired. I can literally walk around a corner to somebody else that's around my age and have that person look at me. We have an interaction and maybe they've never seen a lesbian that's quite in the direction or even a woman that's quite in the direction of how I look. I mean, the haircut is, I've had this hair like this for a long time. And I'll have a really nice conversation with a man, an older man about my age, maybe older. And he goes, it was great talking to you, sir. <laughs> and I think, that guy could hardly hear because if he heard my voice <laughs> and no wonder, and then I think no wonder he was nodding a lot, but it didn't seem like it went with the conversation. <laughs> I don't freak out. Well, you know, I had that literally. Too. I, yeah. I mean, for I, my hair's grown back quite a bit, but I had shaved my head and you know, I was walking down the street and these kids came running out. It's the lady who's bald. And they were so excited. Like they were seeing <laughs> this, like, you know, such a thing. I mean, they were so excited. And so, so part of it is that, that we have gotten so entrenched in these stereotypes that, you know, that, you know, my shaved head was like this exciting thing and you get called yeah. sir simply because yeah. we don't have, um, we don't, we sort of have stopped accepting this, this um, range of, of gender, of sex, of how we are as male and female. And that's what I wanted with, can I get a witness to have such a wide variety of faces skin colors. Mm -hmm. I had accents. <laughs> and that's yeah. part of the optics of I felt like producing something and trying to make an impact so that if somebody tuned in from Australia or they tuned in from Europe, you know, as early in the morning as it was for them or from Canada or wherever, they might have somebody that even if they thought, oh, she's boring or he's boring, I'll wait till the next person. The next person comes on and they go, oh my God, that's me. They're, they're saying the same thing that I went through or similar to it. With all of the people that got fired and this and that, I just thought that can I get a witness could become something that literally was not just an exploration of, of a topic that I think is not going away anytime soon. And that we need to come up with new methods of fighting it mm -hmm. and reclaiming our lives. But then in that, we need to find each other also. And the, the beauty, and I'll go back to what my what my tech person did when she said, Joey, I think I figured out maybe something that'll work for you about the missing of the workshops and all right. of that closeness. There is she such said, a, you get she said, have you ever heard of Slack? And I said, Slack is in Slack.com. She goes, yeah. And I said, I don't know a thing about it. <laughs> now I'm talking to somebody that she said for 10 years, this is a young woman, knows a lot about tech. She's gone to tech conferences for 10 years, she knew what Slack was. And if for anybody that sees this, I don't know anything about yeah, Slack. It's just a and, social, social. Well, it's kind of like having a giant WhatsApp or whatever. Yeah. It's real time, you right. know, chatting with each other. Yeah. And anyway, when she explained it to me, it took me a couple of weeks to really grasp it. And she did an invite and I started looking at it. And, you know, the next thing I thought about and I thanked her and I said, okay, so I can have my workshops. She goes, well, Joey, they're actually called live chats. I said, okay. I'm going to have my live chat 
and I'm going to have Kara Dansky, who wanted to do a workshop and was missing the idea that that wasn't going to exist. I said, if she can handle that, I said, so literally, I can have people with topics, and then we can restrict the number of people, maybe. There could be more intimate conversations about a topic. She said, yeah, it's just like a room that gets created or whatever, and I said, great, and I want to monetize it. And she said, no, Joey, nobody ever does that, and I said, we're doing a lot of things that nobody's ever done. So by the time it got to that, we were having this conversation. I really started to embrace it. I started to contact all the people that I thought would be great to lead a, you know, a live chat. And everybody that I approached was like, oh yeah, way into it, you know, way into it. But the next, the next conversation that she and I were going to have, because we did many Zooms, we did much hand-holding with people. Most of the people had never done one before. And so it took weeks oh. to, to, to get things right. The next guest that she and I were going to be talking to was MK Fain, who lost her job. And what did she do? It's like, I get kicked off Twitter and I think, I've got to have a conference. She gets kicked out of her job and she says, uh, you know, I'm just going to create a feminist version of Twitter called Spinster. So we get MK and now there's the three of us talking. And my tech person tells her and I tell her about the original conference and that my tech person has come up with this idea about Slack. And she thinks it's fantastic. And she goes, no, not Discord. Slack. Yeah. We're going to have to use Discord. Yeah. And then I let the two of them, and I'm watching these two younger people who yeah. know about tech. And I've now grokked, like as, as older people <laughs> say, from Star Trek, I've grokked yeah. what it is. And they start talking and Discord gets, the idea of that gets born, that that's going to be the platform and why, and MK says why. And then I tell her, and I'm going to monetize it. And she went, wait a minute. <laughs> so can I get a witness has become now actually, it's created more of a viable something that people who are feeling critical about what's going on with gender ideology, there are work groups that have sprung up all over the wor world because of the discord chat and some of the, con the conference peep attendees and the speakers that have gotten together. They're doing projects. There's this amazing stuff. So if somebody's interested in this and they and they weren't able to participate, is there a link that you can send me so I can include in the description of this video so that they can find out more about it? Here's the thing. I'm going to be releasing the videos in the next probably two to three weeks, and I have a channel on Vimeo called Can I Get a Witness? Okay, maybe when you release them, you can share me and I can update the information. Absolutely, but I don't have a website. The ticketing page still exists for the conference and it has, I keep it up because it has everybody's hyperlinks to everybody's websites. It's a wonderful resource. Yeah. And we're doing interviews and there have been, you know, some coverages of the, of the conference. There's going to be a, a, there'll be a new thing coming out very shortly, but no, there's going to be another panel coming up a couple before 2020. And who That's knows awesome. what 2021 will bring, but this is, this is helping to be another little piece of this larger movement where people are saying no more and we're taking our words back and we're strengthening little kids. We're saving lives in different ways. The work that you're doing is part of all of this, I feel. So again, thank you, Erin. Well, thank you, thank you for Joey. Me. Yeah, and I really appreciate your sharing your, um, your history and then, and then where you are now. And I kind of like to have you back again in, you know, in a year or even six months and just see how things have progressed because already you've, you've, you threw a big rock and the ripples are now, <laughs> you know, starting to go. And, and, and it's, it's exciting to see that. Um, and I think you've inspired a lot of people to say, wow, um, you know, it's not just me. I'm not alone in my little corner being yeah. concerned about this, that this is, this is an international concern that we need to come together and, and fight. So thank you. Absolutely. And thank you so much for this avenue.